Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Well, the federal government to hand over national grid to independent operators. The federal government of Nigeria, through the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, NERC, is in discussions to transfer the management of the national grid to an independent system operator, as outlined in the Electricity Act 2023. This move aims to enhance discipline in grid management. NERC reported that the recent national grid collapse, which occurred early on Saturday, was caused by an explosion at the Jeba transmission station. Efforts to restore power have been significant, with supply restored in 33 states and the federal capital territory by 1 p.m. on Saturday. This incident marks the third collapse of the national grid um, within a week, resulting in widespread power outages. In response to, um, to this, NERC plans to conduct an investigative public hearing to identify the causes of these recurring disturbances and outages. The commission encourages stakeholders' participation and will announce the date and venue for the hearing in national dailies soon. Well, joining us to discuss all of this is Nick Aguile. He's a public affairs analyst. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Nick. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hello, Nick. Hmm. I think we're having issues um, with connecting to Nick, but we'll try to get that. Anyways, um, I would like to even start with the punch. So um, the punch led with a story this morning, even though we're taking it at off the press. But the story here says grid collapses 105 times in 10 years, uh, despite $1.4 billion loans. And the writer here says, government fails to access additional $2.96 billion World Bank approved electricity infrastructure loans. Another says, Buhari records 93 grid collapses. So we're talking at, at 105, we're talking about 105, but the former president had about 93 grid collapses during his tenure. and. Um, for President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who just assumed office about a year ago, just over a year ago, we've seen 12 um, incessant grid collapses, um, which worries NERC and consumers. Um, I don't know if Nick can hear me now. Nick, can you hear me? Okay. So I will just ride with that. And it's quite unfortunate that for a nation who is the giant of Africa, we have grid collapses. We're even supposed to be supplying electricity to other countries. But here we are. Um, you know, being thrown into darkness. And it's not just like a one-time thing. It's not just so we don't have power right now. It will be restored and maybe another one would not occur anytime soon. Um, maybe like a once in a blooming anomaly. But that's not the case. Last week, in one week, we saw three grid collapses. In fact, in 24 hours, we saw two. It collapsed twice. And you're wondering, after the first collapse, why did they not do something to ensure that it doesn't happen again? For the second one to happen, and then less than a week for the third one to happen, you're wondering who are the people, um, what, are they, what are they doing? What are their job roles? How are they supposed to um, make sure that we're not, we're not thrown into darkness? And now that it has happened, who are the people that are supposed to you know, bear the brunt of it all, the consequences. Whose heads are supposed to roll at the moment? But nothing is being done, nothing is being said. It just seems like, you know, business as usual. Yes, it collapsed, okay, that's, it happens, and we move on. And that's not, that's not right. Because we all know that, you know, power is, as well as fuel, um, power is also like a bloodline for our nation. Most businesses, of course, depend on power. Most families depend on power. Almost everything depends on power. And that's even the reason why people use fuel as an alternative source um, of power, right? So if you're seeing our, our grid collapse like this, it's quite unfortunate and it's quite embarrassing. And I know that during the AFCON, in fact, there was, um, there was a funny thing that was being said by the South Africans when we're going head to head with them. And they called us a generator republic. Can you beat that? A generator republic because we do not have power. So imagine us parading ourselves as a giant of Africa, yet the one thing that we should have, we don't have it and we're thrown into darkness. It's quite sad. 
quite unfortunate. And looking at South Africa, who is a counterpart, they just have, um, you know, how many million people, but they are able to generate over 70,000 megawatts. Nigeria, we're still struggling with about four to 5,000 megawatts, and we have a population of over 200 million people. South Africa has a population of about 60 million people, but we're still struggling with our power sector. Now, the good news, maybe good news, I, I would say, is they're looking on how to hand over all of this to independent operators. And, you know, I have so many questions to ask Nick. I don't know if we have Nick right now. Nick, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Fantastic. I've been going on and on because I have so many questions, you know, to, to ask you. First, we've seen, you know, an incessant um, outage with our grid, right? And we've seen whereby in a week, we've had about three collapses. In 10 years, we're looking at 105, according to um, the, the metrics, the statistics that we have right now, which is quite unfortunate. And I was going to ask you, I know that you know, you're know you into energy and all of that. How, why are we here? Because I was saying, um, for a nation who parades itself as a giant of Africa, we keep having this, and it's quite embarrassing. Also, we can only produce about four to 5,000 megawatts and this is a population of over 200 million people. Meanwhile, in South Africa, they have just about 60 million people, and they are able to generate about 70,000 megawatts. Why is our energy sector, why is our power sector struggling so much? Thank you very much. And sorry to you in the studio and our viewers. I suffered the telecoms grid collapse. Mm. So my data went off, uh, but thankfully it's now being restored. So let's discuss a uh, power grid collapse. Right. Uh, you are very correct, Rume, that successive governments in Nigeria, right from 1960 when we became independent, which is 64 years ago to date, have ignored the elephant in the room mm. in terms of what is pinning down the Nigerian economy. So you will see when governments come in, like this present one, they are thinking about, oh, interest rate, oh, what about inflation, oh, what about un unemployment, oh, let's do transfer what we can do in agriculture, oh, let's uh, hike uh, the prices of petrol, let's hike the prices of electricity, and they are calling it reforms, economic reforms, and they are ignoring the elephant in the room, and that elephant is electricity. So the basic truth is that in this 21st century modern day economy, if you don't have sufficient electricity, then there is nothing you can do that your economy will grow. Simply nothing. Because like I always say, electricity is like blood to a human body. A human body that is starved of blood, regardless of what you do to that human body, you can lodge that human body in the Hilton Hotel, you know, fly it first class and all that human body is not going to do well until it begins to get enough blood. And the um, Nigerian government uh, have lived with this three to 4,000 megawatts that you have been describing for a long time. Mm. Under the current situation that we have now, uh, back um, to 2013, 11 years ago, uh, the government of uh, President Jonathan took a bold step in what they said was the power sector reforms. And what they did was that they privatized. Uh, so just for the benefit of our, for our viewers who may not be up to uh, uh, at breast with uh, power, power, the power value chain, the power value chain is made up of three stages. So you have the generating station, which is just like a generator we have in our homes. Mm -hmm. Then there's a transmission, which is the middle bit. So imagine that you put your generator in a generator house. When the generating power you need a cable to convey that power from that generator house into your house. Mm. In terms of the national power, that is the grid. The grid is the one that transposes the power from the point of generation to the point of usage. And then when you bring the power to your house, you know, you distribute the power to your kitchen, to your bedroom, to your sitting room, and all of that. Mm. In terms of national power, that is what we call distribution. Mm. So these three stages, a government privatized the generation and privatized the distribution. But for inexplicable reasons, government did not privatize the middle bit, which is transmission. the transmission. Mm. So just imagine that in the analogy that I used, uh, I, I was having a, a 5 kVA generator. I decided to upgrade it to 
50 kVA. And then I, I, I extended the number of uh, air conditioners and all of that I have in my, in my house. But I did not up, upgrade the cable mm. that we move uh, 50 kVA to my house. So you see, you see the problem. Mm. The, 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 the generator, if it generates, it cannot come to my house because the cable is still for 5 kVA and not 50 kVA power. Mm. This is what we did 11 years ago. And this is what is pinning down the power sector uh, up to today. So what the president needs to do, and I always call on him when we have these discussions. Well, you know, we have been having these discussions. is to say that, Mr. President, <clears throat> all your efforts at economic reforms will come to naught, except you do one thing. And that one thing is that invest one hour of your time and summon a summit of all the stakeholders in the power sector, let them come to the villa and ask them the one question. And that question is what, Rume, you have accurately asked. Mm. Why is South Africa, with a population of about 60 plus million, generating almost like 60,000 megawatts of electricity, and Nigeria with a population of three, I mean 200 million plus, generating only four to 5,000? And the answers to that question, we give Mr. President the ideas in terms of what he will need to do to improve Nigeria's power situation. So if he doesn't do this, unfortunately, he's going to run out his first four years and possibly another uh, second term of four years. And Nigeria's economy will remain where it is because it's not rocket science that there is a direct correlation between power supply and economic growth. If you don't have enough power supply, your economy will never grow. So this is the situation that we're in right now. All right. Thank you so much for that. So now we know that the federal government, um, they want to hand over the national grid um, to independent operators, which, you know, is a great thing because um, something that we always use to um, look at it holistically is the, um, the telecom sector. And we know how First, you know, Nitel, of course, it was just one person, but the moment it was privatized and other people, other players came in, it was better. If you were buying a SIM card for over 100,000 Naira before, now you can buy a SIM card for less than 500 Naira, and that's even because of the credit that goes in. So we see how more people have come um, into the sector, and the prices that the citizens have to pay is way less, which is great. But here in the electricity sector, um, the Gencos, like you've said, is being privatized. The Discos privatized, but TCN isn't. So now, what's going to be the impact of um, TCN, especially when it comes to working with the Gencos and working with the Discos as well? So if we're talking sustainability, short term, long term, what's going to be the impact of this? Thank you very much. I actually like the comparative that you have done with the telecom sector. It yeah. is apt. Mm. But what happened in the telecom sector? Because a lot of people do say that, okay, uh, the power sector has been privatized, so why is it not working? Mm. You know, uh, And I always say that the privatization of the power sector, the, deal, the way it was done, gives privatization a bad name. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't done well. It, mm. Since it wasn't done well, we, can, we cannot expect to see results. So the first thing that happened differently between the power sector privatization and telecoms privatization is that the telecoms privatization was done to bring in established telecoms operators. So the MTNs, the Econet, the Etisalats, and all of that were already existing telecoms operators. They had the capital, the management, the expertise, the technology to draw upon and bring to Nigeria. And they invested $100 billion plus, as we speak, to take our uh, telephone availability from 500,000 lines that NITE was supplying to over 220 million lines as we speak today. Mm -hmm. And that is why the price has collapsed, rightly, from the 100,000 you've spoken about, because mm -hmm. I actually sold my wife's not nine not here in Abuja for 150,000 wow. more than 20 years ago. So from that kind of price, to, to, to almost free now, we're getting um, uh, SIM cards for. Hmm. Now, what is the difference in the power sector privatization? The power sector privatization was not 
done to bring in established power sector operators. We know those who have these licenses. Most of them just went to CAC, registered uh, companies, and then moved over to NEC, National Electricity Regulatory Commission, and obtained licenses. They have not put in anything. Actually, when we privatize a power holding company of Nigeria, which is the successor of NEPA, we were doing between five to 6,000, possibly even 7,000 megawatts. And after privatization, we are down to three to 4,000 megawatts. What's the result? It means they haven't yet put in money. Because if they put in money, just like the telecoms did, the output should have risen from that five to 7,000 to today we'll be talking about 30 to 40,000. You get what I mean? Yeah. Megawatts. But, but that power has not risen. So what the federal government is simply doing now is that they are trying to extract enough revenue from only 3,000 megawatts to pay all these companies that have come to line themselves up in the power sector. Imagine that MTA, Econet, and ETA and Globe came and they were using NITES 500,000 lines only to make money. You know that telephone will still be very expensive. Hmm. You know, the, the only way that telephone is cheap now is because the operators, the private sector operators, first put in money to increase output to 220 million lines as we speak today, and they are making money from it. The power sector operators have not put in money. If they say they have put in money, the question will be that, why then is capacity reducing and not increasing? That means you're not putting money in the right places. So now that the federal government seems to identify that transmission is a huge bottleneck, mm. because like, like I said earlier, the, the, the Jenkos cannot generate what transmission cannot carry. And, trans, uh, and the discos cannot distribute what transmission does not give them. Mm. So transmission is a clear bottleneck, and I, I listen to the managing director of the transmission company of Nigeria. He was on a national TV network. Was that not yesterday or two days ago? And he clearly confirmed that they are not making investment, enough investment in transmission. Mm. He pu publicly confirmed that. And the reason why they are not making enough investment into transmission is because the government of Nigeria is almost bankrupt. We know this is a government that is living on loans, on borrowings. So they don't have money to put into transmission. Transmission needs anything five to ten billion dollars of investment mm. every year to be able to expand that capacity. And that is like uh, more than Nigeria's uh, le revenue generation. So now that the government is saying, oh, we want to hand over transmission to private sector operators, we don't know what details these are, but all I can say is that if it is a complete handover mm. of the decision making so that the, the private sector brings in their management structures, bring in their expertise, bring in their technology and their money, then it will work. Mm. But if it is what the NMPCL is doing <laughs> with refineries, mm. that means decision making is still with the NMPCL. They are only bringing in contractors who 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 are under NMPCL. You can see that the refineries are still not working, and the same way transmission will never work if government does not let go completely the way um, telecoms was let go. Mm. You know because MTN and Co would not have succeeded if it was nighter. She's still managing them. Right. And you get what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If NITEL was still managing MTN and MTN was to use NITEL masks to deliver telephone to Nigerians, we would still not have telephones today the way we have them. So the government should just go the whole uh, length mm. by letting go of transmission truly into the private sector. I hear people that say, oh, whoa, we cannot uh, let transmission into private sector because transmission is a national asset uh, it has security implications if the private sector take them over and i ask them the question between transmission and telecoms which one has more security implication mm -hmm. because as we speak today our president is picking up either an mtn line or airtel line mm -hmm. or maybe glow line and he's speaking to the chief of defense staff mm -hmm. and he's speaking to the national security advisor Mm -hmm. And the national security and, advisor and is data to and privacy involved.
Exactly. So you know? if we can let uh, telecoms in private sector hands and our leaders are using this private sector telecom to run Nigeria, mm. uh, what is it about transmission? All right. There's nothing about transmission. So government should just simply let it go. Once government lets transmission go, into private sector and they start bringing in investment. Imagine mm. they sink in about a hundred billion dollars into that sector. The capacity of transmission will be expanded to probably the fifty to seventy thousand uh, mark. But it's not only transmission that is the problem. Or the right. other problem of the power sector, as we speak today, are the discourse. Mm. All right, so, Nick. Yeah. I, I wish, I wish, I yeah. really wish we had a lot of time to really dive into this, and I think we'll have to bring you back because, like I said, I have so many questions. You were talking about, you know, monies that we need to sink in. I know that at least one point four billion dollars was, you know, sunk into this whole power sector. Of course, we need to sh be sure that even when we move this over um, to independent operators, it can be maintained um, effectively, efficiently, and then, you know, even the tariff for the common man, because all we're talking talking right now might be jargons to a lot of people because they're like, I just want electricity and I want it at a fair price. So there's so much that we can really dive into. But sadly, we're out of time and hopefully we'll bring you back just to discuss this. We want to say thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure having you on our show. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rume, and thanks to our viewers for staying, to, for, for staying uh, with us. And uh, like uh, Rume said, we'll come back and... Uh, Hope yeah. I will break this thing down at yeah. another day. Thank yeah. you so much, sir. Have a wonderful day. We'll be speaking with Nick. Uh, you, too. you too, sir. We'll be speaking with Nick Agule. He's a public affairs analyst, and we've just been looking at, you know, our national grid and the fact that the federal government wants to hand this over to independent operators. Well, this is how much we can take on the show today. Thank you so much for having the breakfast with me. My name is Rome Paulson. I'll see you again tomorrow. Have an amazing day.